Hello, my name is Mandy Brown, and you're watching Kayoki Baptist Church Online Worship Service. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your day with us. If there's something we can pray about with you, or if we can help you in any way, contact us via our website, kayoki.org, or by calling the church office at 706-541-1086. We want you to know that you matter and your story matters. God is doing some amazing things at our church. If you'd like to learn more or explore more, the perfect place to do those things and more is at our next Kick Kayoki Information Class. Next Sunday, October 30th, 3.30 p.m. in the Small Fellowship Hall in Building A. We hope to see you there. The very next day, Monday, October 31st, is our Family Fall Festival. We can't help but be very excited about all the families within our church and the surrounding area being here to enjoy games, rides, inflatables, great food, and candy. This free event will be held from 6 to 8 p.m., so make plans now to come get in on all the fun. In a few minutes, Pastor Steve will continue the sermon series, Making It Count. First, let's praise God together in song.
Welcome to the online service of Kaioki Baptist Church. We are going through a study uh, of the book of James, and so as we get ready to, to turn there, to turn our attention, we want to, uh, want to encourage you to open your Bibles, go get your Bibles, go get a cup of coffee, um, get what you need for the next 30, 35 minutes or so as, as we cast our focus on the Word of God. We're, we've entitled this series, Making It Count, because that seems to be the underlying message of James' letter to uh, first century Christians. We have mentioned that James may be the earliest book written, uh, probably along with the book of Galatians, uh, of all the New Testament letters. It's fascinating, James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, and when he begins his letter, he calls upon um, the name of Jesus as his authority, and he refers to himself um, as the servant of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I want us to look, or James would have us look, at confronting partiality, and it's a um it's really a of a, a point that he begins to lie down lay down in chapter 1 we're going to be in the first 13 verses of chapter 2 but in in uh verse 16 of of chapter 1 James writes do not be deceived and then he begins explaining um how we are to live out the physical component of our commitment to Christ. We have mentioned that um, in our day, re- the term religion can sometimes carry negative connotations. Uh, but for James, as he uses it at the end of chapter 1, he means it in, in the best of ways. It's, it is religion is the, is the outward manifestation of what I believe it's the living out of my faith Um, so when he writes about visiting orphans and widows in their affliction that is the living out the outward manifestation of what i hold to in faith inwardly I, i i love this passage that we're looking at today and really all of the book of james because James, known as one of the more practical letters in the New Testament, everywhere you turn, he underpins his argument theologically from a biblical basis. And really, that is the way life ought to be for the Christian. Our, our faith is very practical. It affects everything we do. It affects every thought we have. But it does so, we approach life, we live our faith biblically. We constantly cast our eyes back to the truth of God's Word. And as a church, it works out this way, and particularly the book of James. Kaioki, our desire is to declare the greatness of God as He transforms lives by loving and reaching people and making disciples of Jesus. And we, we consolidate that by using three terms, declaring, demonstrating, and discipling. Uh, and and, and how, how do we, what do we use as a measuring stick to tell us, okay, are we doing that? Are we declaring God's greatness? Are we dem- demonstrating His love? Are we making disciples who in turn make disciples? Well, James is a great prompt for us to say, yeah, maybe not so much, or yes, we are, we're doing it well, we're doing it, uh, we're making it count, we're making this life count, life in Christ. So, let's read chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. 
For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, James confronts an issue here that we still face today, and that is the problem of partiality, showing favoritism based on outward appearance. Uh, Paul did much the same. He, in Galatians, he, he writes, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And, uh, and that seems to be James' point uh, as he addresses this sin of favoritism. So I want to break this down and I want to start um, by addressing the issue. So the scenario that James gives us, the scenario is of two men. All right? You've got two, you've got two, two men. Someone has called this, this passage the usher's dilemma. Because clearly James is writing in the context of the body of Christ. Uh, These are people he he talks about in verse 2. People that come into uh, their assembly. That word literally is the Greek word synagogues. It's the word for synagogue. Um, We don't know if if that is uh, a reflection of how early this letter was written. That that, uh, many of the churches were still meeting in synagogues. or that's just the term that, that James uses. But, but you, have, you have two men. One of them comes into the service to be seated who is dressed to the nines, right? He, uh, he rides in on his new two-hump camel. Two-hump must be a hybrid. Uh, he's wearing his designer turban. He's, got, he's accessorized to the nines. He's got his gold rings on. And subsequently, as a result of the way he looks, he is given a seat up close, a seat of honor, a seat of prestige, for no other reason than it is perceived that this man is a wealthy man. Then you've got some other guy who uh, walks in, Literally, he walk. He has to walk to church, and once he gets there, his his feet are filthy, his clothes are stained. He walks inside, and uh, and nobody pays him much mind. Uh, he's not anything special. Probably got his clothes from uh, or through charity, and subsequently, as a result of his appearance and and the way he is perceived he is given a seat in the back of the room. And and often, likely, um, he's told just to to sit on the floor. And so, 
after describing this situation in verses 2 and 3, James brings a bit of a rebuke to the believers. In verse 4, he writes, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now that's the problem. He paints out the scenario, two different men, and then he brings the issue, the problem that is, they have made distinctions on their own, according to their own scale, according to their own perception. He, he writes to them, you've made distinctions and you have become judges. Um, the problem that James has with partiality and favoritism and in much deeper context, the problem that the Lord has with favoritism is that what you do when based on appearance you favor one person over the other is that you sever what God has made whole we are one body in Christ you are making a judgment based on your wisdom based on what you perceive of an individual instead of what God has said to be true in that we are all made in his image we all bear the image of god uh, david writes in first samuel that you know man judges by outward appearance but god judges the heart but james doesn't stop there at the end of verse four he ascribes a motive to to the distinctions that they've made to their favoritism and that is he says you are doing this out of evil motives you are doing this out of evil motives um let me let, let, i want to i want to pick up on that in in momentarily but before we go any further i want to i want to kind of make an addendum to the scenario that, that, that James gives us. And I want to address a question. Is, is, is James kind of pushing for a type of socialist structure where not only is every man and woman equal, but every man and woman is exactly the same? and is to be treated and honored exactly the same. And so let me, let me just, let's, let's go back to the Word and say that the Bible does not condemn recognizing or honoring certain people. People who are honorable, who have done honorable things. The truth is, it demands that we do so. In the very next book in, in the New Testament, Peter, in 1 Peter 2, writes that we are to honor everyone, okay? Love the brotherhood, another distinction. Fear God, of course, and get this, honor the emperor. In our case, he would say honor the president, honor the governor, honor those, Paul writes in Romans, honor those in authority submit to them how do you submit to them out of honor that is a that is a sense of honoring uh, solomon in proverbs 24 writes my son fear the lord and the king and do not join with those who do otherwise two verses later in verse 23 he writes partiality in judging is not good now here's the point. There are times that we honor people and, and show honor, and we make, we make a distinction. For example, in a few weeks, uh, we will honor those that have served our military on Veterans Day. Uh, that, that is not wrong. That is good. That is healthy. But what James and the rest of the Bible is condemning is this sense of showing and showing favor and, or in treating people for the better or for the worse based on nothing but their appearance. 
Here it's based on wealth in James 2. It's based on how an individual is dressed. In other places, it's addressed based on background, maybe religious background. So many of the New Testament letters were written to confront this, um, this, this favoritism between Jews and Gentiles. This, uh, the, the, it's believed in Acts 6 that the office of deacon is first seen in the early church when some of the widows were being shown favor over other widows. And so the apostles address that. That's what the Bible condemns. And if we could just take it a step further, in this, in this condemnation, we can honestly pull out of the text of Scripture that it applies to skin color. For skin color is a way to make a distinction based on nothing more than appearance. And so when I favor a particular race over another, or when I mistreat someone of this race or other races than my own, then I am in direct violation of the Word of God. And James says, that is evil. Okay, now, we, uh, we're not leaving out verse 1. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted us to understand what it is James is addressing. And now we'll go back to verse 1 and see the standard for our actions, right? Um, wh- how do we know? What, when we say, okay, make this count. Make life count. Make the way I treat people count. What is the standard? Engaging what counts? What matters? In this case... What is the standard for not showing partiality, for not uh, mistreating or showing, showing favoritism for impure, sinful reasons? Well, James begins this whole discussion on favoritism in verse 1 this way, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Pretty simple, isn't it? Show no partiality. How? As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, He grounds how we think about other people and how we treat them, how we act toward other people, privately and publicly how I speak and think myself in my own thought life, right? When I'm tootling down the highway in in my car or I'm taking a walk and it's just me and the Lord, how I'm thinking, but also publicly. When I'm in conversation with my friends, if I'm at work, if I'm I'm listening or I'm, I'm telling jokes, that is based, the foundation of that, James says, is our relationship to Jesus Christ. But here's the fascinating thing, is, is how he does this. Fascinating in the sense of how he addresses the issue of giving glory to people based on their appearance, their wealth, their celebrity. Now, we just saw James says, don't do that. Don't give glory to people for unbiblical, ungodly reasons. And notice how James refers to Jesus. This is about to connect. He he calls in the ESV, um, he, he refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. I want to I wanna just address that phrase and why he uses it um, because it is so very relevant to everything that flows. He is setting up the scenario of these two men that we just looked at by grounding it in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of glory. In his commentary, 
uh, on this passage, Alec Mateer points out that Jesus reflects the Father's glory. And he, and, he, and he takes us back to a passage that we actually looked at last week when we were uh, looking at, uh, at chapter 1. But in, in, in Exodus 33, Moses comes before the Lord, and in verse 18, he says to the Lord, Please show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh, the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So then, in verse 5 of, of chapter 34, the Lord actually does this with Moses. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, Moses, there, and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now here's what Mateer writes about, about this passage. He says, The Lord's name is much more than a statement of who He is. It is a statement of what He is. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's glory. God Himself come among us in all His goodness and in the full revelation of His person. I, I, hope, I hope your heart is, is, is stirring. Um, when James refers to Jesus as the Lord of glory, there is so much wrapped up, bound up, in that, in that fact, in that statement, that He is the Lord of glory. The writer of Hebrews said that He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. John, in his prologue, in John chapter 1, talks about the Word, Jesus, being made flesh, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only Son, of the Father. So the, this is not just a one-off. The re realization that G in Jesus is the glory of God Himself. And now James is basing his statement on the way we make judgment, on the way, way we make assessment of others. It is wrapped up in the glory of Christ who is the glory of God. The point is, the standard for glory is Jesus, who is the glory of the Father. Therefore, we are not to attribute the glory of God to a person based on appearances. Instead, ask yourself, why would I show favoritism to someone based on their celebrity, based on the way they look, the way they dress, the accent that they speak with, or the car they drive. Why would I do that? Well, generally it's for selfish reasons. I want to impress them. I perhaps want to get their, into their favor. I want, to, I, want to, I want to get them to notice me. Why should these things matter to a Christian when the Lord of glory has already given me His favor. He has noticed me. And the Bible says He has known me and does know me. That He holds me in His hand. Why would I seek after the affection, the attention of anybody else? 
I am subverting, I am settling for a lesser glory when I seek the favor of someone who just looks the part. Okay, so here we go. We've got this scenario of these two men. But James starts in verse 1 by giving us the standard, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, I want us to look at what, uh, I want to borrow a phrase that's used elsewhere in the New Testament, and that is the word scandal. I, I want us to look at the scandal of grace, because James uses this notion uh, of the way God saves, and, and he does so in a scandalous way, right? I mean, if... Let, let's just be be candid with each other based on what we read about the way these these believers have gathered to worship and they treat these two men differently entirely based on appearances right that's the way it's it's telling that's the way we would judge on who who deserves to know christ who deserves to be saved who deserves heaven who deserves eternity well clearly it's the wealthy it's the good looking it's the it's the one that has everything but notice how james addresses this in verse 5 listen my beloved brothers has not god chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him now i don't want you to lose this distinction God, James says, has chosen the poor. He has chosen the weak. But the criteria of being chosen, the, 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 the issue of salvation is not predicated on your financial status. All right? He makes that very clear. God doesn't merely or only choose the weak. He has made those to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him. Who loves Him? Those that have been loved by Him. We love Him because He first loved us. Those that are in Christ. And James is just addressing the obvious. It was true in his day. It is true 2,000 years later. As we, as we go through this passage, for the most part, those that come to Christ, those that the Lord bless and saves, tend to be more so the downtrodden than the upper echelon of culture and society. It just is the case. It doesn't mean those that are wealthy and those that uh, have been blessed financially aren't, can't be saved. Of course they can. God doesn't save uh, the poor at the exclusion of the wealthy. Not all the poor are saved, right? All, uh, you, you look through the Bible, there are all kinds of people. Most of the people in Scripture are the needy. The, uh, th those that have been uh, depressed and repressed and, and uh, rejected by society, uh, you, you, they're all over the place. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, right? He, he acknowledges that. So being poor is not a prerequisite for salvation. And being rich is not a guarantee of lack of salvation. Not all the poor are saved, but often they are. Not all, not, by the way, not at the exclusion of the wealthy. There are many wealthy people in the Bible that are saved. Nicodemus, Matthew, the tax collector, uh, Lydia, the Apostle Paul himself. But in general... In general, James's point here is, he's saying, look around. Most of you 
are poor. Verse 6, you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, are not the rich, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? He's just being incredibly practical here. He's saying, who is it that cheat to benefit themselves? It is those that already have. Who is it that malign the glorious name of God? It is the celebrity. It is the one who senses they have no need for God. God chooses the outcast to show His grace. He chooses the weak to show His strength. He chooses the unlovely to show the extent of His embrace. It is a scandal, this grace of God that is found in Jesus Christ. It's it's a scandal. In 1 Peter, the Apostle writes of the very fact that um, many will come and will stumble over Christ. He is uh, the rock that will crush many. Because they will not submit, they will not acknowledge their need of grace, of Christ and His salvation, of His glory. They want the glory of God, but they refuse to bow to the all-glorious image of the Father, Jesus. Well, finally, I just just want want us to to cast our eyes on the solution to partiality. He he, he closes out this, this topic by being, as he often and normally is, very, very practical. And he tells us that the solution to favoritism or partiality is love. But not just any kind of love. He's going to specify a biblical love, a godly love. Notice how he writes this in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Now this royal law, what he's doing is he's quoting Leviticus that we are to love your neighbor as yourself. And remember, Jesus reiterated this when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. James focuses on the second part of, of these two commandments. And he says, you do well when you love your neighbor. But if, verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Don't miss this. And again, he's going he's to go, he's going to about to turn to the commandments. But he's going to say, don't think that you can keep and you can, you can boast and depend on yourself as being an advocate and faithful to God's Word when you've got this blight, this very obvious issue that you, are, you, you yourself are stumbling over, you are sinning in. And that is the area of showing partiality, just based on appearance. Verse 11, For he who said, Do not commit adultery, God, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It is a great reminder that ours in Christ is a salvation that it gives us liberty, freedom, steeped in mercy. How so? Because God is a merciful God. 
and, 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 and the characteristic of God's glory, part of it is His mercy. And so we who have been shown mercy are to extend mercy. And we cannot segment our, ourselves, our lives, our faith, our walk with Christ. We can't segment th- this portion of Scripture from the larger body of the Word of God. We are either faithful to it to the most minute point or we have violated all of it. You might say sin is sin. Sin is sin. God is a God for the rejects as well as the wealthy. But James says we are to treat the two just the same. Just the same. William Booth, the, the, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, um, which began as a movement in the slums, as a ministry to those who lived in the worst parts, the ghettos, the slums of London in the 19th century. When being challenged on why he would commit so much time, so much effort, so much money in ministering to the very least, the, the, the bottom of the barrel, the scum of the culture. This is what Booth, how Booth replied. We know what Jesus can do. So you just take your infidelity down there. See if it changes anyone for the better. What a great reminder of the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. So how are we to see, how are we to come to um, an understanding when everything in, in, in us wants to admire those who have and as a result, maybe not a stated intention, we tend to neglect those who can't do anything for us, who offer us nothing in return. How, how are we to, to deal with that? We have the mind of Christ who took you and took me, who could offer Him nothing, but He gave everything for us. Not because we were better or smarter or richer or better looking. Not because of anything that we had. But because He loved us. That's grace. And in His grace, He extended mercy. And those that we encounter that God leads across our path, we are to extend nothing less in the name of Jesus to the glory of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for what You have given to us and for, for the man or woman who is, is listening now to my voice who does not know Christ. May they come to You not out of what they have done or can do for You, not out of their religion, not out of a church membership or all their deeds and efforts, but Father, trusting nothing in themselves, but solely on the grace that is in You found in Jesus Christ. May they trust Jesus and Jesus alone and know Your promise that if anyone should call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stay with us as we close our service with, uh, with a song and worship, and I look forward to being with you next time. May He bless you. Amen. In dark.
I will 